Our next speaker is Ambassador David Newton, who is the first American ambassador in Iraq from 1984 to 88, after we resumed <coughs> relations with that country, and later was ambassador to Yemen. He was over 36 years in the Foreign Service, and after his retirement, was in the um, was served six years in Prague as the first director of Radio Free Iraq. Uh, Ambassador Newton. Well, you can see as the first ambassador to Iraq, it's all my fault. <laughs> In any case, uh, I've followed Iraq for a long time. Uh, I must say, first of all, to thank the Rumi Forum very much. I had the great privilege of taking one of the trips to Turkey. And I have to say, I've been around a long time and uh, spent a lot of time in the Middle East, particularly in the Arab world. And uh, I have really, I don't think I've ever seen anything as inspiring as the amount of work being done by the, the volunteers of the Gulen movement. I mean, we visited uh, hospitals, clinics, uh, universities, uh, schools, uh, amazing schools. All of these uh, run by private people with private donations. Uh, the Middle East, uh, as, as uh, one of our previous speakers, uh, Professor Davies, very uh, eloquently explained uh, causes of violence in the Middle East, uh, where I served for over 20 years, uh, is certainly the epitome of violence, as he demonstrated. To see this kind of peaceful tolerance, uh, something I unfortunately didn't see too much of in where I served in the Middle East, uh, really, uh, I, I have found uh, very inspiring, and I thank them for inviting me today, giving me the chance to, giving me the chance to speak. Uh, one of the advantages of speaking later is you get to hear the, the comments of the previous commentators, and our, our two professors really have given me a lot of school for thought, uh, particularly as Professor Davies pointed out, the high level of violence in the Middle East. And uh, I must confess, having served there so long, uh, I have my own take a bit on, the, on this area. I, I certainly see the Cold War as an important contributing factor, but to me, having served in a region where you had four revolutions, uh, Algeria, Egypt, uh, Iraq, and Iran, and so many wars, including several Arab-Israeli wars and civil wars, it seems to me, uh, the way I conceived it, that was what you were seeing was the, an attempt, uh, uh, attempts uh, often distorted, even when successful and often unsuccessful, to deconstruct physically uh, systems and structures created by a system of colonialism. And uh, you still see this going on to some degree, and I think a good deal of the unrest and violence in this area is, is the result of uh, the, both the good and the bad aspects of a long era of colonialism from the West. Uh, and of course, I come to this as a practitioner. I spent 36 years in the Foreign Service and six years in running Radio Free Iraq, uh, even three years as an army officer waiting for the in Germany, fortunately in the Cold War, waiting for the Soviet Guards tank army to come rumbling down the, the Fulda Gap. So I've seen plenty of uh, hostility. And uh, uh, over my career, I've really come to the conclusion that if there's, there's to be any chance to make the world a better place, uh, which is something that we diplomats also try to do, then I think the most important human value one should always try to promote is tolerance. I think tolerance is the fundamental basis of any attempt to create systems uh, that are peaceful. And as I said uh, all too often in my career, I found uh, uh, that intolerance was driving events, at least in the region. And I would have to say there's certainly no uh, shortage of that vice even in our own country as well as other parts of the world. Uh, uh, and this conclusion about the importance of tolerance, if there's to be any hope for uh, greater peace in the world, is, has caused me to value, as I said, in particular, the work of the Gulen movement, which uh, 
is I find a truly moderate and tolerant religious movement, but is also doing much valuable education work, and I would like to see it spread uh, particularly beyond uh, the strong efforts it makes in Turkey and surrounding areas, I would certainly like to see more, uh, more possibilities for people in the Arab world where I serve to take up this kind of movement. Uh, when I was asked to give a talk, I chose this talk about the media because although I was a State Department Foreign Service officer, not the U.S. Information Agency, I did a good bit of work in public diplomacy. Uh, particularly because I was living in the, in the Middle East so long. And then in my second life, if you will, I was responsible for starting up and running uh, Radio Free Iraq, which was a service started in 1998 and became part of the 50-year-old tradition of uh, Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty, which uh, played such an important role in the Cold War, uh, but in these days uh, not too many people are familiar with. Well. Uh, turning then to my real subject about the role of the media, uh, I would have to say that the media, in a sense, uh, they have been with us, you can think of them perhaps for half a millennium, if one wants to start with the beginning of the printed word. Uh, they, of course, are directly connected to the great communications inventions, printing press, telegraph, radio, TV, and now the explosive and very valuable spread of the internet. Uh, and if you read the history of them, you recall that each one of them in, in turn was touted as a, a great advance of civilization, which people said would herald the advance of peace and tolerance. Uh, I think of Edward R. Morrow and his hopes for TV, for example. Uh, and would it were so, I'm afraid, uh, there's no denying the great benefits brought by these inventions, but I don't think they have lived up to their billing. Uh, and one could, in fact, argue that they've been perhaps even as often used as, uh, as a means to spread intolerance, violence, and even war. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, I have an MA in history, and I love to go on about history, which, uh, of which my favorite definition of history is one damn thing after another. <laughs> But uh, in any case, uh, one could uh, cite history in looking at history, for example, the role of the printing press in, s in stimulating the Thirty Years' War, uh, the role of the telegraph in stimulating the Franco-Prussian War and the American entry into World War I, uh, William Randolph Hearst's use of the press to drive us into the Spanish-American War, and of course, uh, Hitler's masterful use of the radio to incite support for his various invasions, uh, destructions. Uh, I myself remember the June 1967 Arab-Israeli War, uh, hysterical appeals on Egyptian and Yemen radio calling, simply calling on listeners screaming out of control to destroy, maim, and kill. Uh, uh, now in Afghanistan, oh, we have, we're experiencing a repeat of uh, of an experience in, in the Burundi genocide, the use of mobile FM radios to identify specific victims to be killed by the armed elements. Now, I don't mean to suggest that the media do not also promote worthwhile values. Uh, radio, TV, and the internet are unparalleled as educational media, able to reach very large numbers of persons. Uh, uh, well, we've seen perhaps ourselves in recent years the growth of uh, programs designed to reinforce existing prejudices, mm -hmm. often with distortions and even falsehoods. There are many examples of programs in our national media that inform, educate, and stir critical thinking. Uh, of course, many people think of National Public Radio, PBS, I, I cite the Christian Science Monitor, and even the much maligned CNN. Uh, which a recent analysis pictured as squeezed between MSNBC on the left and Fox News on the right. Uh, but because we're focusing today on the media and peace, uh, I think we should really look at international media uh, that have uh, a wide reach, especially in this case radio and TV, and this is where I, of course, have some experience. Uh, 
Uh, but we also have to realize the wonderful effect that the internet is having in gravely weakening the control of authoritarian, re authoritarian regimes over information content. That is particularly uh, apparent in the, in the Middle East where the revolutionary republics, uh, which uh, sometimes people like myself now refer to these days in the Middle East as hereditary republics because uh, the sons of presidents seem to uh, uh, succeed their fathers as presidents. But these people, uh, when they came, these regimes, when they came into power, uh, when we think back to the 50s and 60s, totally dominated the media and deprived people of, of almost all information that didn't agree with their ideology. That, uh, that effect has gone forever, has been totally smashed. Uh, smashed by the internet, uh, despite efforts uh, in these countries to control the internet. Uh, but also, we've seen the rise now, thank goodness, of independent media. Uh, some of them criticized, but nevertheless, uh, a great improvement over the, over the government media where we saw in the past. Uh, now, I would, when you talk about uh, these international media, I would assert, because this is my experience, that promoting peace and tolerance is not incompatible with providing objective information to its listeners. One can encourage universal values such as security of the person, political participation, human rights, including women's rights, uh, and uncorrupt free economies without professing a bias towards the specific policies of any outside nation and ideology. Uh, that, I say, was my experience uh, running Radio Free Iraq since we operated in the Radio Free Europe, Radio, radio Liberty tradition as a so-called surrogate radio. First of all, of course, we broadcast in Arabic as all of the RFERLs uh, services broadcast in the local languages. Uh, we had no obligation to defend American policies or politics. We operated as an Iraqi radio station. And when our listeners said to us, uh, we, I have to say we were government funded through the Congress, but we had a firewall to protect us from uh, political pressure. Uh, I would have to say that when a, uh, an Iraqi listener said to us, well, you don't sound like an American station, you sound like an Iraqi station. We were extremely pleased. That's what we were trying to do. And uh, we tried very hard to relate to our audience and give them uh, as much news about possible uh, as possible, especially when Iraq under Saddam was a denied area. Uh, in honesty, uh, I have to confess that uh, a few years back, uh, around prior to the 2003 invasion of Iraq, we had to uh, fend off some pressures to support the run-up to the war. Uh, but we had the firewall, we had the law on our side, and 50 years of RFE-L tradition. So when I heard this uh, uh, pressure, I have to admit it wasn't too hard to let it go in one ear and come out the other. Uh, uh, something that uh, was, you know, would have killed us because uh, when you broadcast objectively and you build up an audience, uh, not only is it a mis mistake to try to broadcast propaganda, but the experience shows us that if you want to kill your audience, figuratively speaking, uh, the best way is to broadcast propaganda. People will will stop listening to you because you're, you're especially if you're broadcasting to an area which has heard from its own government, nothing but propaganda. They don't need any more. Uh, uh, as the, uh, I mean, uh, all the language services of Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty, know that you had to avoid that uh, by the, as the plague. Uh, and recently, uh, to bring it up to current events, uh, the Radio Azadi, which is the uh, the station in Pashto and Dari in, in Afghanistan is now the, the most heard radio station in that country. And just recently, last month, the uh, RFERL has launched a new service in, in Pashto 
to, uh, to Pakistan, to the, to the Swat Valley, the Northwest Frontier Province, and to Waziristan, trying to preach tolerance and peaceful solutions to problems, trying to discuss the truths of Islam that we heard about in the, in the video in a situation in which there's a, a great deal of violence. Uh, and if you forgive me for just a second, I'll just very quickly read, uh, you know, what is the mission of uh, Radio Free Europe, uh, Radio Liberty. Uh, first, to provide objective news analysis and discussion of domestic and regional issues. Second, to strengthen civil societies by promoting democratic values. Uh, third, to combat ethnic and religious intolerance and promote mutual understanding among peoples. Fourth, to provide a model for local media, assist in training to enhance media professionalism and independence. And finally, to foster closer ties between countries of the region and the world's established democracies. Uh, I strongly believe these, these things are not incompatible with, uh, with being objective and, uh, and, and, and also promoting these, these uh, I think, universal values. Now, I've given the example of Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty, because it's the one I know best. But there are many other international broadcasters who do the same thing, both on radio and TV. Of course, by far the best known is the BBC. Uh, VOA also operates in this uh, model as a surrogate station, uh, although it also has a well-defined role, which is separately identified to explain and uh, uh, American policy and to explain the United States, something which, uh, which uh, we did not have to do or weren't required to do. Uh, I also recognize that there can be cultural variations in objectivity. Uh, that's quite uh, obvious in the Arab world. You can also see it in differences between the United States and Europe. Uh, in the Arab world, you have now TV stations like Al Arabiya and Al Jazeera which also aim at objectivity, although we sometimes criticize things we don't like and they criticize things in us we don't like. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, I remember watching Al Jazeera once in the bloodiest period of Iraq, and the, the picture you saw had a, was in a hospital which had, where there had been a terrible bombing. In the lower right of the picture was the doctor they were interviewing about all the problems the hospital had in dealing with these, these people. In the background, in the left, was a gurney with a very bloody body lying on it. I happened to see the same interview, this time in English, on an American TV station, and it only focused on the doctor. The, uh, the body was eliminated. Uh, and Arabs see American practices that minimize pictures showing the blood of war as a deliberate attempt to sanitize views of wars we are fighting. Americans uh, see the much more lenient Arab view of showing the blood of war as a, as a political message. Uh, you can see even between the United States and Europe uh, uh, different views on what is acceptable in terms of sexual leniency and so forth. So there are different views of objectivity, but not so far, I think, as to destroy the concept that there is a universal value in being objective. So uh, in closing, I, I'd like to repeat that while the media have made great strides technologically over the centuries and now have a much more educated audience, you can see them in some respects as a, as a largely empty vessel that you could fill either with tolerance or intolerance promoting peace, but sometimes promoting violence. Uh, now, journalism is an honorable and often very dangerous profession, uh, one which often requires act of, acts of courage and risk to your life to find truth and expose violence. So it's really up to us as the, the customers, if you will, uh, of the media to encourage honorable practices and support what we ourselves value and discourage in the way of bad practices and to do this by our own choices in the media, to recognize efforts to promote peace and tolerance in the media, value it and support it, and to discourage the opposite uh, both in our country and abroad. Thank you very much.